Well, if you got your Bibles, we will be preaching or teaching out of the book of Ephesians. Uh, we've been kind of, this is a, I guess you could say this is a three-part series. And I kind of took the title, and I explained this previously, from a book that I had read a long time ago called Sit, Walk, Stand. It was a book that was written by a pastor named Watchman Nee. He was a Chinese pastor who was arrested and persecuted for his Christian faith. And, you know, I just basically kind of took the title, although at the same time I am preaching some of the concepts, but it's been so long since I read the book. To be honest with you, I couldn't really tell you a whole lot about what the book said other than it has to do with these concepts. Now, in the first two passages or the first two sermons that I, that I preached about, we talked about the concept of sitting in Christ. Amen. I don't want to spend too much time. I know sometimes when I do a review, I go way too far in one direction or the other. But to sit in Christ and the way that I described it was that it's synonymous with resting in the Lord, trusting God. Amen. The, the Bible says in the book of Ephesians that we're seated with him in heavenly places. The Bible teaches that. Jesus is at the right hand of the Father, and the Bible also teaches that we're in Him. And in the mind of God, you're already in Christ. And really and truly, the battle's over. The, the war is complete. When Jesus died on the cross and He breathed His last breath, and He said, It is finished! It was done. It was a done deal. Well, what was done? Well, He provided righteousness for you and I. See, He was the sinless one that came to die for the sinful ones, amen? amen? And he took upon himself your sin and my sin, and he died in our stead. And, and there was an exchange that took place. I like to use that terminology, the great exchange, if you will, where he took upon him our guilt, and we were given as a gift his righteousness, amen? amen. And now we got to learn what that means and to learn how to be seated in Christ. Uh, we're gonna, I don't want to, you know, we'll, we'll come back to that a little bit. But then the next concept was walking in Christ. Well, before I go there, I gave you a couple of examples of, some, of the fact that sometimes it's difficult for the people of God to learn how to sit and to trust and to rest. And there's a lot of different ways that that can manifest in our lives, you know. Uh, sometimes we try to take matters in our own hands and we, we try to get outside the will of God, outside the timing of God. I was just having a conversation with someone this morning before church started and, you know, they were believing God for a particular thing, but nothing was really working out. At the time, and then now all of a sudden they're believing God for the same thing and doors are starting to open. The reality of it is, is that sometimes it's not that it's not God's will. It's just not God's time. Hallelujah. And many times we will try. Listen to me. We do it a lot more than we're willing to admit. We will cause conflict in our own lives because we hurry the plan of God. We move outside of the will of God and it can be manifest in different ways. I'm not going to spell it out for you. You feel in your own little thing that you have a tendency to not want to trust and rest. And believe God for Moses did it. Uh, Jacob did it. You know, uh, Peter did it time and again. We see characters of the Bible getting outside of the will of God and taking matters into their own hands. Then we talked about walking in Christ. Amen. <laughs> Sit and walk. You, we got to walk with the Lord because, you know, the truth is, is that our faith and, and, and our walk with God, and we're on a journey. Amen. Amen. We're on a journey and we're walking out a life upon this earth. Now, I don't have to preach this too hard to most of you in here because you hear me talk about it almost every time I preach. That this world or earth that we live on, the Bible talks about the fact that we're in the midst of an evil age. Because, see, the spirit that's pervasive in the atmosphere, not in this place necessarily right now, but pervasive in the atmosphere of the earth where we're living is really the spirit of Antichrist. Amen. The enemy has control over people's lives. Yeah. He has control over people's lives because of this thing called sin. When mankind sinned against God, it caused him to receive a sinful nature. And then ultimately, each one of us, if I could speak in terms like this, has thrown our ante into the pot because we're, we're, we're in the card game. Each and every one of us have done our own share of sin. And the result of that is that it allows the enemy permission in our life to cause us to go sometimes in a direction that, that God would not have us to go. But God has called us not to walk like an Egyptian. I know I gave my age out last time when I talked about that. But instead to walk, hallelujah, like a Hebrew, like a child of God. God's always had his own people called by his own name. Amen. And, and still today, it is the same. There's a separation line 
Moses came down from off the mountain and he drew a line in the sand and he said, whoever's for the Lord, come over here on this side and everybody else that's staying on the other died from the judgment of God. Mm. There, as we walk out on this earth, this fallen earth, we're going to realize not everybody's going to follow the Lord. But for the people of God, God has called us to walk Amen. with him. Now, finally, we come to this place about taking a stand. And that's point number three. And I title point number three, take your stand against evil. Yes. In Ephesians chapter six, verses 10 through 11, we're just going to review these couple of verses real quick. I did get through these two verses last week, but it says in Ephesians chapter six, verse 10, it says, finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. Verses 12 and 13. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day. And having done all to stand. And so we see in these four verses of scripture, the word stand used, then withstand, then stand again. And he's re the Holy Spirit's repeating himself about standing and withstanding. And literally, that's what that word withstand means. It means to take a stand against or to oppose. And I, last week, I kind of made a little bit of a joke about that word wiles in the King James. And I, and I reminded you of a cartoon uh, called Roadrunner. I don't know if you remember that. Some of you are old enough to, to remember it. Some of you don't. You don't have to raise your hand or laugh too hard because then people are going to know how old you are. But it used to be a cartoon called Roadrunner, right? And there was a, uh, his, his nemesis was Wiley Coyote, wiles, the wiles of the devil, trickery and traps. The reality of it is, is that we live on a fallen earth and you and I are not wrestling against flesh and blood. Yes. Sometimes it'd be easier if we were. Don't get me wrong. They got some folks that are, you're not going to be able to out wrestle them. But the point that I'm trying to make is it'd be a whole lot easier if we could see and we knew what it was that we were facing. But the reality is, is that no, we cannot see the enemy that we're fighting against. Right. Right. And many times we find ourselves in frustration and blaming the people around us and the ways that things have taken place and we want to pinpoint it's because of this person or it's because of that person and the reality is is that no, that they're, just a, they're just being a tool, maybe sometimes being used as a tool by the enemy. And listen, yeah. don't think that God will ever use believers as a tool. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry, don't, don't think that the enemy will never use believers as a tool to bring, help bring destruction in your life. Yeah. He will use other believers to set a trap for you. Yeah. Trickery, deception, deceit to trip you up as you're walking and journeying this, this Christian travel, if you will. Right, right. Yeah. But God has called us to stand up and to oppose that which is evil. I went into John 17, 14 through 21. We're not going to read the whole thing, but if you'll remember, that was Jesus's prayer right before he went to the cross. You remember that? When Jesus was saying this, he was saying, Father, I've completed the mission. And he knew that he was about to go to the go to the cross. And he said, I'm not asking you, I'm kind of paraphrasing, I'm not asking you to take them out of the world. But instead, I'm asking you to give them strength, amen, to keep them from the evil one. So the reality of it is, is that even though we live on a fallen earth and even though there are principalities and powers that we have been called to stand and oppose and to resist, God knows that those that those entities are here. He knows that their plan is to destroy our lives. Nevertheless, God has called us to walk this Christian journey out upon this earth. Why? Because he wants there to be a witness in the land. God has always had a witness in the land. He's always had a voice a voice piece throughout the annals of human history, throughout the Old Testament, the prophets spoke forth the word of God and gave revelation to the people of God. And in turn, the people of God were supposed to live their lives out before the world so that the world would see that there was a difference between them and the world. Now, a lot of times we in the church don't like this kind of preaching. We don't want to be told that some of the things that we're doing or some of the ways that we're living may be worldly and not spiritual or not look Christ-like. 
And I'm not going to sit here and try to press every little button around to till I finally hit whatever button might be yours, you know, and, and hold on to my little buttons that I don't let you know about, right? But the reality of it is, is that there's so many things upon this world that try to draw us in and try to cause us to look different than, than what we're supposed to look like. We're supposed to look like Jesus. So Jesus said, I pray for them that you would keep them from evil. Now, regarding standing in God's protection plan for the believer against evil, one thing that we must be aware of is the fact that Jesus is our protection and defense. Just like a, a soldier without his armor, a Christian that doesn't allow Jesus to be his defense will be vulnerable for destruction. Now, whenever I get into these next few passages of Scripture, I want you to envision yourself as though you were in Christ. <clears throat> a lot of times, you know, I've done many teachings on this kind of thought, but I'm just going to go ahead and write it up on the board because I want you to, I want you to be aware, I want you to be thinking of what, of what I'm trying to say. This prepositional phrase, in Christ, but sometimes it's, it's, it's worded like this, in Him. And then sometimes it's worded like this, in whom? And in, in Him you have your being. In whom? you Through Him you've been delivered. Multiple times this prepositional phrase is used. And what I'm trying to explain to you is the fact that whenever you see this prepositional phrase used, I started to try to count it one time because somebody was saying that it was in the Bible over 160 times. But the reality of it is, is that I was just... I was just uh, repeating what I had heard, and I don't really like doing that. So I started trying to count, and I just got tired. I mean, I think I got to at least 100 and something, and I just got tired, and I quit. That was a long time ago. But I'm just telling you that, that it's in there, amen? And that it's, But it means something specific. And what it's talking about is that when you're in Him, when you're in Christ, when you're in whom, that there's been a radical transformation that's taken place. And y'all get y'all hear it so often. I hope that you don't get tired. I hope that you don't take a nap on me. But let me just say this, that a spiritual transformation, a miracle happened in the heavenly realm, in the spiritual realm, when you truly gave your heart to the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. On the day that you were saved, you were put in him. Amen. You, you, you got a new position you were first born in the physical realm of Adam, born in sin, born with a sinful nature. That's why you had to be born again. And when you were born again, hallelujah, and what happened was somebody told you the good news of Jesus Christ. And when you heard the good news of the gospel, you took your faith that was given to you by God. God gave you faith. God gave you a free will. And when you exhibited your free will faith in Christ, a miracle happened where the old man that was born of Adam, literally in the mind of God, became one with Jesus at the cross. I mean, I'm telling you, you rushed back 2,000 years in God's mind and you died with Jesus at Calvary. You were buried with him. And just as he was resurrected to newness of life. So, hallelujah, were you. Amen. If you're in Christ. Amen. The problem that you and I have as believers is that we don't understand that. Yeah. No, I mean, I get it. We understand that, you know, we were sinners and that we needed a Savior. I get all that. We, we understand what Jesus did at the cross as far as us being born again. To some extent, we get that. We, we've heard what the preacher has said, and, and we believe it because it makes sense. Because most of anybody, we wouldn't even be in this church today if we didn't agree that we needed, we needed the Lord. Amen? Amen? The trouble that we have, though, is walking and standing. Well, I mean, we have trouble sitting, too, but we have trouble walking and standing. What are you talking about? Knowing how to stand against the forces of evil. Knowing how to stand in opposition against the ways of the world. The world's drawing on us, trying to pull us back. Each and every corner you turn, every way you turn, listen to me, you just thought you were strong. Right. Come on, somebody, help me out here. You just thought you were strong. And the reality of it is, as Brother Larson used to say this all the time, don't ever think that Slewfoot's going to, I don't know he said it like that, but I'm saying it. Don't ever think that Slewfoot's ever going to stop because he's never going to quit. Satan will never quit. And if you ain't been nibbling, he'll keep on changing bait. And he'll keep on throwing it in there till you find your nibble. And then when he sees that nibble, poof, he's going to set the hook. And once he sets the hook, 
Lord help us because we're going back into a wilderness experience. But I'm here to tell you right now that the problem that we run into many times is as believers, we did not understand that the same way we received him through faith in Jesus Christ and what he did for us at the cross is the same way that we continue to walk in him each and every day. As you receive Christ Jesus the Lord, so shall you continue to walk in him. What are you talking about, preacher? Each and every day I have to keep my faith focused on the Lord and what he accomplished. And when I do that, now I'm clothed in the righteousness. I'm getting ahead of myself. I'm clothed in the righteousness of Christ. And now that I'm clothed in the righteousness of Christ, I have access to a power source that's greater than my willpower. You ain't going to get it done in your willpower. I don't care how strong you think you are, how bad you think you are. I don't care how many fights you want. You ain't going to win this fight in your own willpower or your own strength. Satan will chew you up and spit you out. He's done it to many a better man than any of us ever in here. <laughs> Help us, Lord. Help us, Lord, to be strengthened by you, to walk according to your will. So I want you to see yourself in Christ. Amen. Listen, I'm going to go ahead and draw this. Look, this is Romans chapter 6. I know that I used to do this all the time, right? The old man born of Adam, he's unhappy, he's sad. The new man born again in Christ. When you put faith, this is what I was talking about. When you, this is your first birth, broken, dead, crooked, walking with your lame foot, putting you out the way. But when you heard the good news and you put faith in Christ and what Christ has done, not just who he was. Come on, somebody. Amen. Jesus' preaching didn't get you to heaven. No, he told you about the way to get there. Jesus' miracles didn't get you to heaven. He proved that he was the Son of God and that the power of God flowed through him. It was Jesus' death on the cross and paid the penalty of your sin that's going to get you there. And the resurrection proves that his work, we use this term a lot in medicine, efficacy. It was efficacious. What does that mean? It was effective. It worked. The work of Jesus at Calvary Great worked. God. Why? It was efficacious. How do we know? Because he rose from the dead. And the penalty of sin is death. But death had no right to hold him down. That's why the grave couldn't hold him. Hallelujah. That's why he resurrected on the third day. Look. The old man. Born again in Jesus. Buried with Jesus in, in the tomb and a new man resurrected to newness of life. And now look at this. You're in him. Hallelujah. You're in Christ. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. It's your new position. Yes. I say it all the time. It's like a new neighborhood. We upgraded. I don't know. Y'all probably don't remember this either. But there's an old show called The Jeffersons. <laughs> Moving on up. <laughs> We're moving on up. Yeah, there's an upgrade in the neighborhood, right? What I'm trying to say is, is that when you got saved, hallelujah, now there's a new spirit that's pervasive in the air. You can have access to grace, the that's presence right. of the Holy hallelujah. Spirit moving and operating in your life. Amen? Yes. Three scriptures that talk about that. This one here, you can go to that one first if you want. Romans 6, 5. That's part of what I was drawing up there. It says, for if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall also be in the likeness of his resurrection. Amen. United. You know, in the Greek language right here in this passage of scripture, it's using words that talk about uh, where we get the word synonym from. We became, but in the idea is, is that we became one with him. We were united with him. Spiritual miracle. It's almost like, I'm not trying to get weird on you, but it's almost like a baby in utero. She, one with the mother. We became one in the mind of God, one with Jesus. Hallelujah. When he died, when he was buried, and when he was resurrected to newness of life. Galatians 3.27 says this, For as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put him on. Now we've talked a lot about the fact that this particular baptism is not really talking about water baptism. Water baptism is a perfect outward sign of, of what really took place spiritually because, you know, when the old man goes down in the water, that's representative of him dying and coming up to resurrection, right? But look at this scripture here also, Philippians 3, 9. And be found in him, not having my own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God. By faith. God gives a specific kind of righteousness. Amen. And I just used these scriptures because I wanted you to see 
the, the, the terminology and what it means to be in Christ because I wanted you to see yourself clothed in him when I began to go through these particular pieces of the armor of Jesus. And the reason why I made such a big deal about it is because a long time ago, I know when I first started getting opportunities to preach a long time ago when I was even do, preaching in youth groups, uh, you know, like at Cornerstone Ministry way back in the day, I didn't understand some of the things that I'm that I try to teach today, or you know, I say try because I know that the only the Holy Spirit can be the teacher is what I'm trying to say. The the points that I try to get across, I didn't understand these points then, and I know for a fact that I myself have preached these passages which I believe to be wrong now, and and now I desire to preach them right. Amen. And the way that I preach them wrong, I believe, is the is whenever I used to say. Basically, this is what you need to do when you get up in the morning. You need to put on your armor of God. Okay. The problem is, is this, is that if you're in Christ, why, why were you out of him? The truth of the matter is, is that we don't realize this. And I'm not trying to get all technical on you. Let's just kind of slow down a little bit. And let's just try to make it as simple and clear as what we can. That, you know, to be in Christ, to put on the armor I want you to know that each piece of this armor is actually representative of Jesus. That's right. Yes. And what I want you to understand is, is I hope you can get the Holy Spirit. We need the help of the Holy Spirit. That it's a very fine line when we move from focusing our faith on Christ and what Christ has accomplished right. to some type of mechanism or some type of action that we now are trying to do. We don't even realize we're doing it, but we're shifting the object of our faith. That's a good word, right? Good. Object of faith. You know, I think about I think about this concept a lot. I know I talk about that. Object of faith. Do you ever think about some things? You know, I, I like the, I like the fact that Brother Larson used to say all the time that as Christians we need to be thinkers. So I've tried to think about some of these things. For so long, I never even thought about the word faith. It was just a, like a very abstract term. It, it didn't necessarily mean a whole lot to me. But when you read the Bible from the perspective of the finished work of Christ, starting even from the beginning of God calling out Abraham, creating a nation through him, and ultimately giving us Jesus, and now all the focal point being on Jesus, being the darling of heaven and dying for us, it becomes real clear of what God intended for the object of our faith that's to be. That's right, that's right. And many times what has happened is, is that we've learned from the traditions of our fathers. Amen. And well, that, that's my little way of saying, because I've been in, and I'm not picking on denominations, I'm not. Because Lord knows that you call yourself non-denominational, now you've just created your own denomination. But what I'm trying to say though is this, is that I have been around a lot of preachers. And one of the things that I began to realize after a while was that a preacher taught another preacher this, and then this preacher taught another preacher this, and this. And there's nothing wrong with preachers teaching other preachers. That's not what I'm trying to say. But we sometimes can get pigeonholed or tricked or duped into believing that that's automatically what the text is saying. And we never like went back to the text with a blank slate to study it out for our own self. And then we come to the realization, Lord, help me. I've been believing something that wasn't even necessarily the truth of your word. So what I'm trying to say is, is this, is that many times the way this passage has been preached is that you got to every morning go through the ritual of putting your armor on. I, you know, I got to shod my, I got to uh, girt my loins with truth. I got to shod my feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. I got to put my helmet on. And I can remember when I first heard the teaching on that, I can remember waking up in the morning and starting to try to do that. Okay, Lord, I'm going to put my helmet on. And some of y'all don't laugh too hard. Y'all done that too. And I mean, if, if you feel like I'm wrong, keep doing it. You know, I mean, I'm just saying, I just, I, but I don't think that's what the Lord's saying here. Right, right. Come on now. I live in a real world, folks, and sometimes I hit snooze one too many times. And I don't have time. What if I miss the helmet? Does that mean I'm, he gonna get to take me out? No. I'm supposed to go to bed in him and wake up in him. Hallelujah. The object of my faith is Jesus. And so what these elements or these pieces of the armor are supposed to be are representatives of different aspects of Jesus. Many commentators would tell you, and it's probably true, that Paul, because he did write this letter in, in, a, in a Roman prison, and more than likely he's looking at a Roman soldier. And he's checking out his armor, and, he's, and the Holy Spirit's moving on his heart, right? 
Because the, the word of God is Theo Neustos, breathed by God. Amen. And the Holy Spirit says, is, is speaking it to him. And he begins to explain that these are what aspects of Jesus, that you're in him and you're clothed in him. And this is how you need to see yourself. Let's look at uh, Ephesians 6, 14. There's two of them right here. It says, stand, therefore, having your loins girt about with truth and having on the breastplate of righteousness. Now, this belt that we're talking about, it says to have the loins girt with truth. It's talking about a belt. And you got to be reminded that the clothing back then was a lot different than the clothing that we wear today. Now, even men now. We may be talking specifically about a Roman soldier, so that might have been a little bit different because it seemed like their skirts were more like mini skirts, a little shorter, <laughs> at least in the movies they are. Whereas a lot of times uh, the, the Jewish men or even like the people in Greece, you know, they would wear long flowing type robes, right? But nevertheless, the, the, the clothing had to be kind of snugly placed up against the body. It had to be held together in some type of way because it was kind of flowing and it would be cumbersome and it would impede the progress of them whenever they needed to get somewhere. One concept behind girding the loins with truth is that after as the belt or the sash was placed on, that sometimes like your regular person, he would grab the, the, the gown that was up underneath him, he'd pull it up through his belt, and he and he kind of like, well, I mean, I don't mean to get weird on him, but it's kind of like making it more like a jock strap, I guess. But at the same time, it was it was tightening it up and it was it was forming because you know you can't run a fast race if you got long flowing robe that's tripping your feet. You can't continue to walk the course if all this stuff is cumbersome and in your way. See. When we're walking this pathway, we need our loins girt with truth. On the pathway, we need to know truth versus that which the enemy would bring and is deception. That's going to hinder our walk and hinder our way. So the wet belt was used to keep the clothing out of the way so that progress wasn't hindered. And Jesus as truth will be the belt that protects us from hindering traps that the enemy sets along the way. Amen? Amen. Amen. When you're on the journey and you know that there are traps along the way, Amen. Jesus is the pathway of truth. Amen? Amen. Look at John 14, 6. Jesus says unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes unto the Father but by me. You know, that word way, I've always been amazed by that word. It mean, The word in the Greek is hadas. What's important, though, is that if you read the definition, it describes an easily discernible path. <clears throat> I, I used this analogy before, and some of you, well, most of you guys and also some of you girls that, that maybe like being in the woods or whatever the case. You all remember when we were young, we go exploring in the woods and we all of a sudden we find this path. Yes. It, was, it was already there. It was, a, it was an easily discernible path. Because people had been traveling that way. I remember one of the scriptures where it talks about the fact that John the Baptist came to prepare a way. And he was preparing a way for the way. Hallelujah. Amen. He was, see, because by the time Jesus showed up on the scene, the water was very muddied. Religion had taken over. It was very difficult for people to see the true will of God. Amen. And I'm here to tell you that Jesus is the truth as we're walking on this earth. And the truth will provide an easily discernible pathway for us to continue to walk. And sometimes you're going to be faced in situations and you're going to, you're going to be thinking man's advice versus God's advice. Mm -hmm. God help you. If you don't know the word of God for yourself, Amen. God help us all if we don't know the word of God for ourselves. Amen. Amen. It, it cannot be truthful to you. Really, the only counsel we need is the Lord. That's right. Amen. Praise God. The only I mean, don't listen. Part of being a pastor is, has, you know, some counseling connected to it. It should be biblical counseling. Amen. The, the, the only counseling that we really need is the, the truth of God's word. Amen. I've heard preachers say before, but all the answers aren't in there. No, every answer you need is in there. And it might not be written in black and white for you, but I can tell you one thing. If you dig deep enough, you will find the answer and you will know which way you're supposed to go. And sometimes even coming to the preacher, he might give you the wrong information. The reality of it is, is that you need the truth of Jesus to guide you on the discernible pathway. That's 
Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Man's counsel, the word of God's counsel. You know the real the reality of it is, you know what you want to know what it is? We got a surrender problem. <laughs> Come on, somebody, help me out. The preacher's preaching good now. We got a surrender problem. The word of God is clear on which way we're supposed to go, but we oftentimes don't want to surrender to the known will of God. Our flesh gets in the way. Our flesh says, I don't want to. And we end up being like some of the Old Testament Jews. And we become like the word of God says, stiff necked. He says, don't be like the horse or mule and will not come unto you unless with bit and bridle. And so he's over there trying to bring us in. He's trying to pull us in. And just like the apostle Paul, whenever he, before the road to Damascus, he said, Saul, Saul, you kick against the pricks. And I know I've preached that before, but it was like a goad. It was a pointed stick that you'd shove in the hindquarters of an animal. And basically it was saying, Paul was over there kicking. He was kicking against the prick. Get that goad off of me. Get that, get that poker out of my hindquarters. I don't want to go. And that direction and so the Lord had to blind him and cause him to fall down on the ground because he was so full of pride that he couldn't even see mm -hmm. couldn't even see that he was destroying God's very work help us, help us. Yes. and that's the problem that we have we don't want to surrender to the known will of God yes. help us to surrender Lord because listen on the other side is only heartache and destruction right. Lord we need your truth we need to gird our loins with your truth we need to walk according to your ways Lord Amen. Help us to surrender, Lord. And so there was two things listed in that first passage. It was the, the loins that were girt with truth. Jesus is our truth. And, and I'm just talking about that whole Bible. You know, this Bible talks, this, this whole word is, is, is Jesus. I mean, I'm just saying it. It really is. You know, I used to think you could go too far because some people even preaching Jesus was the tent pegs. But no, Jesus wasn't tent pegs. <laughs> They were made out of silver, and silver was the, te the temple tax, and that was built. That was called the redemption tax, and the whole foundation of God was built on redemption. What I'm trying to tell you is, is that every page you turn, and the Lord, if the Lord would open up our eyes to it, we'd see Jesus written, and we'd see a common red thread that pulls the testaments together, and it all comes back to Jesus Christ and Him crucified. I can sit here, hey, Hallelujah! I can sit here and try to prove it, but it would take you long. It would take too long. And you know what I'm talking about. The Passover, the Day of Atonement, time and again, shedding of blood, animal sacrifices, all pointing to Jesus. Mm -hmm. Amen. Amen. Lord, help us. Help us to see your truth. It provides a path for us to walk according to your will. The breastplate was the other one that was mentioned in that verse. And the breastplate covers and it protects all the vital organs. You know, it says it, that it was the breastplate of righteousness. Can you go to uh, Romans chapter 5, verse 17 for me? In Romans chapter 5, verse 17, it, in the chapter 5, in Romans chapter 5, the word gift is used at least five times. Mm. Ultimately, in verse 17, we find out what the gift is. Look at this. For if by one man's offense, who's that talking about? That's talking, that's talking about Adam right there, right? For by one man's offense, death reigned by one. See, what, that, what that's telling you right there is that's talking about a sinful nature. That's talking about the fact that born of Adam, we've all been born into sin. If you think you, have, you, ain't, you don't have it or if you think that your sinful nature has been eradicated, you are a disaster ready to happen. You have... You have some messed up DNA, folks. Yeah. Yeah. I said it last week. I'll say it again. You don't have a genetic marker that says you're a homosexual or one that says you're a drug addict or one that says you're an alcoholic. You got a genetic marker that says you were born a sinner of Adam. Yeah. And that's why you had to be born again. You did receive something from your daddy, but it wasn't what the psychologist wants to tell you it was. Instead, it was what you received from your father, Adam. But hallelujah, you got a father in heaven that has a plan. Yeah. Amen. And he has a recovery process. Too, and it's called kill the old man and give resurrection life to the new man. If by one man's offense, Adam's offense, death reigned by one. Listen, through Adam's offense, death affected the entirety of the human race. I've said it before, but I'll say it again. Only two men walked on the face of the earth without sin, but only one of them died that way. Yeah. Adam was created and walked on earth without sin for some period of time, but he became a sinner. And the only one that ever walked on the earth that had no sin was Jesus because he 
was born of incorruptible seed. He was born of the virgin and he had no sin in him. So sin is spread to the entirety of the human race. But look at this. Much more they which receive abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness shall reign in life by one, Jesus Christ. I, that is so powerful right yes, there. Yes. Sometimes when I see passages of scripture and I just slow down and I slowly start to kind of like digest it and chew on it a little bit. And when I see the, I just, I just love the fact that I'm, that I'm starting to understand the Bible. <laughs> you know, that I can read it and actually understand it. I just get excited about that, you know. Because for so long, even as a preacher, you know, I did. Look, Jesus Ultimately, what this is saying is, is that the righteousness, the gift of righteousness is your ticket into eternal life. Amen. Amen. Righteousness is your ticket into eternal life. That's what this whole plan was about. Outside of Christ, you're not righteous. In Christ, you are righteous. If you're looking at your life and your motives and your actions and all that you're doing, you're going to now listen to me. I'm not condoning any old kind of lifestyle. That's what the people started accusing the Apostle Paul of. That he was saying it was okay, you could just live in your way because where sin did abound, grace did much more abound. God forbid, how shall we that died to sin live any longer therein? No. God hasn't called us to live in the, in the midst of sin. God has called us out of sin. He called us into light, amen, and out of darkness. But what I want you to see here is that this is what the plan of God was always about. Amen. When you talk about the fact that God said, prepared in advance, that he would pre he, God said he preached the gospel in advance to Abraham. Mm. And, and, when, and when you read in that Galatians chapter 3 passage, it's, uh, the whole thing is surrounding the concept of righteousness. God preached the gospel in advance to Abraham. Wow. Hallelujah. And all, that, we, we could, that the Gentiles could also be partakers of righteousness. Yes. Righteousness is a gift given by God. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. It was a gift. You can't earn it. Amen. You can't, you, should you strive towards the Lord? Absolutely. But you can't earn the gift of righteousness. Amen. You can't work righteousness. I mean, you can do works of righteousness, but you can't work good enough to be righteous. He gave us the gift of righteousness, amen, and that's ultimately what I guess I'm trying, or what I was just trying to say right there is, is that he is our breastplate of righteousness. He gave us the gift of righteousness. That's who Jesus is. He is our righteousness. We've been clothed in him. We have righteousness on the outside of us. We're in Christ. When the Father, we have righteousness on the inside of us. When the Father sees us, he no longer sees our sinfulness. He no longer sees our failure. He sees the righteousness of of Jesus. You've been covered Amen. with the blood of the Lamb. Amen? It's His righteousness that gives us access to God's grace. Look at Romans 5, 1 and 2. I said it's His righteousness that gives us access to God's grace. So listen, the first, that passage that we just read, that's really connecting itself more to salvation. Right? Eternal life. You, it, even, you know, if death came by one man, even much more so, the abundance of grace through the one Christ Jesus. And he talks about the, the, that righteousness was a gift and that it ultimately leads to eternal life. But what about today? What about today, Lord? What about the journey that I'm in the midst of? How do I get through this thing? Same way, because of righteousness. <clears throat> Look at Romans 5, 1 and 2. Therefore, being justified by faith. I heard that, that that was one of the things that they taught the, the kids yesterday was, was the, what the concept of justification means. You know, for the longest time, I've been in spirit-filled churches for a long time, and we, we, the preacher never even mentioned the word justification. I'm just talking about, I'm not picking on anybody. I'm just saying that the churches that I went to before, I had never heard really what the, the Baptists were talking about it more than what we were. And it's so important that we understand what justification literally means. You know, when you got saved and you were placed in Christ, you were now made righteous in the eyes of God. That's your new position. That's your standing before God in Christ. But the word justified literally, literally means that the Father declares that to be so. Right. The Father is the one that says it. See, you might not feel real righteous this morning. Right, right. But, that's not, but the word of God says something different. Hallelujah. God says something different. He's spoken a word of declaration over your life. And listen to what it says. Therefore, now because you're justified, yes. 
because he's been talking about justification up to that point. By faith. Amen. He said, therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Next verse. By whom also we have access by faith into this grace wherein we stand. Look at that. How simple is this message? By whom? Who's whom? Jesus. We have access. That means entree. That means the ability to open up the door and to walk in. We have access into this grace. And what is this grace going to do for you? It's going to help you to stand. God says to stand in the midst and to oppose evil in the midst of an evil age. And the way that you're going to do that is because you've been justified. You've been made right in the eyes of God. And because of your new position in Christ, because of the fact that you're now clothed with righteousness, you have access. You can just walk in. You're walking in Christ. And guess what? Grace is flowing in your life. Hallelujah. Grace is flowing in your life. I can't say that enough. Grace is flowing in your life. Thank you, Lord. Not the grace that, look, I used to, I know that this is dumb, but I used to say it all the time. I'm not talking about the kind of grace that Britney Spears used to sing about. She never sung about grace, but this was her song. Oops, I did it again. Like, in other words, we always thinking about grace as, oops, I did it again. Lord, forgive me. There is that grace for that, but that's not what this is talking about. This is talking about, no, you ain't got to oops no more. Hallelujah. You don't have to keep oopsing time and time again. Instead, you can stand in the opposition against the evil of this world, and you can walk in Christ. You can still receive grace. You know where grace comes from? This was revelation for me. Grace comes from the person of the Holy Spirit. Everything that you're going to need upon this earth as you walk this thing out is going to be dispensed to you from the person of the Holy Spirit, but it's all based upon what Jesus has already purchased for you, the ransom price that he paid when he shed his blood, hallelujah, and he gave you the gift of his righteousness. Now you have entree into the grace of God that empowers you and gives you the ability to stand in the face of the enemy. We just got a surrender problem. Lord, help our surrender problems. Amen. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 15. It says, in your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. What does the word preparation mean? It means what it says. <laughs> How do you prepare for a test? I mean, I'm talking about when you were in school. I'm not talking about the way Matt prepared when he was in junior high or his one little year of high school <laughs> that he went through. That's not what I'm talking about because there was no preparation going on then. But once I got into nurse, once I got into nursing school and went on a nurse practitioner, and even when I worked on my theology degree, I did some studying, man. I prepared. I did not want to, and I tried to teach this to my girls. I'm like, dude, this is the reality. I know I call my girls dudes sometimes. This, dude, this is the reality. When you walk up in that classroom, you know whether you know the material or not. Don't sit here and lie to yourself because if you don't know it, it's your own fault because you didn't prepare. There has to be a time of preparation. And when it comes to the word of God and the things of God, there has to be a time of preparation. I'm not talking about changing the object of your faith from Jesus Christ and him crucified to how much you read the Bible. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about preparing and putting your time in to understand the word of God. Because, listen, when you actually go in there and you take all that information that you've been studying, and you're not putting faith in all the stuff that you've already studied, you're putting faith in the fact that what you studied is the truth and is going to That's give you right. the right answer when That's you put right. it on the test. Amen. And now you have to test. And it's the same thing with the Word of God. You study to prepare thyself, right? A, a, a workman that rightly divides the word of truth, he shall not be ashamed. You study and you do the preparation in order to learn the word of God so that whenever the test comes, you walk it out, you apply the information, you believe it. That's the object. I learned this. Amen. God gave some to be apostles and prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers for the equipping of the saints to do the work of the ministry. Yes, we need teachers, but the Holy Spirit is the greatest teacher of all. Hallelujah. You have an unction from the Holy One and you know all things. No, the Lord gave teachers and it's important, but the Holy Spirit is the greatest teacher of all. And when you hear the word of God combined with the anointing of the Holy Spirit, it should register in your heart and it should tell you what is truth. It should tell you what is right. And you need to prepare yourself according to uh, uh, and surround yourself with the word of God. Learning the truth about Jesus. Amen. Amen. 
So there's no opportunity to trust. We need to learn how to trust in the right thing. Faith in the wrong thing leads to a wrong direction. And a wrong direction leads to destruction. The gospel is the good news of peace. He said, shod your feet. In other words, put on your shoes of the preparation of the gospel of peace because you're on a journey and you're walking. He says this. He says, he said, he says that it's the God, it's shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. You need some peace in your life? Yes, Lord. You ever felt like you had a bunch of chaos going on? Yes. Mm -hmm. Everything's real loud and you can't really concentrate and you just don't know what to do and you're being pulled in so many different directions. Mm -hmm. Guess what? Jesus is truth. Amen. John 14, 27. He said, peace I leave with you. Oh. This is all these passages of scripture where Jesus is about to go to the cross. And he's trying to console his disciples. He's trying to let them know, listen, I'm not going to leave you like an orphan. It's a good thing that I go away. For if I do not go, he will not come. Who's he? The comforter. The Holy Spirit. Called alongside to help you. He says, peace I leave with you. My peace I give unto you, not as the world gives it, give I unto you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. Listen, this text right here tells me that the world is offering peace. But it's not the same kind of peace that Jesus gives. See, God's peace is internal and eternal. I wrote that down myself. God's peace, proud of God's peace is internal and eternal. The world's peace is external and temporary. It's just external and temporary. It'll make you feel good on the outside for a short little period of time, right? But listen to me. If it wasn't the Lord and it wasn't the Lord's answer for you to access the true peace of God and instead you went running and looking for it in another area or you were blindsided and tricked by the enemy into thinking that it was peace, it ain't going to last. Right. Right. ain't going to last. I've been having a problem lately. I better quit saying I've been calling everybody boo at work. <laughs> <laughs> ain't going to last, boo. <laughs> it ain't going to work. I had to apologize to all my nerves. I'm like, dude, I called all y'all boo today. <laughs> <laughs> I realize I do that whenever I'm being a little sarcastic. So I apologize for that. It's not going to work, boo. <laughs> Whenever you try to find peace from the world and the world is offering you peace, it's going to be external and temporary. And when it wears off, you might even be in a worse off predicament than what you were before you got into that mess to begin with. Yes, yes, that's true. Somebody help me here. Yes. The world offers a false peace, but peace with God addresses the sin problem and brings us back into proper relationship with him. That's right. Amen. Amen. It's a peace that settles the soul. Yeah. All right, moving on. Ephesians 6, 16. And I thought that I wasn't going to have enough information for this message. <laughs> Above all, taking the shield of faith, wherewith you shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. Mm -hmm. You know, the shield of faith, and I've talked about this and I even wrote it on the board. He, he is the object of our faith. So when we talk about faith, once again, we have something directly that we're instructed in the word of God to believe in and to believe upon. It's a sure foundation. It's, it's something that's built on the rock. It's not built on the sand. It would, you know, the storms can't, can't change it. The, the book of Hebrews, when they, when they sang that song today, that's, that's actually a scripture out of Hebrews. He's the anchor that holds beyond the veil. Amen. He's our shield of faith. When he died, all power was given to him and that the forces of evil were defeated and we're seated in him and he's seated at the powerful right hand of God and we have victory. Now, one of the things I got to tell you is that I said it already, but I'm going to say it again because it's the context of this passage. Satan is going to continue to fire or shoot fiery darts, Amen. fiery arrows. He's not going to quit. You got to be careful how you say stuff nowadays. But, you know, you remember them old cowboy and Indian movies? How they'd circle around the little stagecoach and they'd shoot those fiery arrows. <laughs> the enemy's never going to stop firing fiery darts. 
He's never going to try to, he's never going to rest. Even in the scripture where it says that when Jesus was tempted of the devil and it said that he went away, the devil, it means he went away temporarily. He never goes away for good. He's not going to quit till he's thrown into the, the Gehenna, the final death. He's not going to stop, but guess what? We have a shield of faith that will quench or extinguish the fiery darts of the enemy. I know a lot of times people have taught this as the thought life, and i got to tell you that most times sin that's manifest in the life starts off in the thought life. And you and I both know it, that many times we started down a pathway where we thought the wrong thing, we were already saying the wrong thing, we were getting into the wrong mess, our conversation was already changing, we allowed stuff to take place, long before we ever got to the part where we actually did it, the, the, the reality of it is, is that we were headed there, and the Lord was trying to protect us, and trying to get us to turn away, but I'm here to tell you that, that once again, we had a surrender problem, listen, as soon as the enemy starts to bring those fiery darts against you, can I tell you that the Lord will give you victory in your thought life too. Amen. The Lord can do that. Amen. You can't do it. You go ahead and you try to get all your favorite scriptures and try to quote it away. I'm not trying to tell you that, that it's a problem to quote scriptures. But if you change the object of your faith from grace that flows from the Holy Spirit yes. because of yes. your, your position in Christ. And you quit believing that. That I'm completely dependent upon you, Lord. I'm dependent upon your finished work. And from that flows your grace and your power in order to strengthen me to get me through. And you instead start putting your faith in the scriptures that you quote and the rebuking of the devil. At some point in time, the devil's going to be laughing at you all the way to where he leads you like a, with a carrot before your nose to the, to the sin that he's desiring to bring you to. Amen. Ephesians 6, 17, the helmet. It says, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. You know, the helmet is the protection for our head. And where I, where, the way I'm preaching this right here is that he is supposed to be number one. Amen. Colossians 1.18 says this. He is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have the preeminence. What does preeminence mean? It means the first thing. It means first place. You remember how the preacher used to say that? Oh, you put God on the back burner. Jesus is supposed to be preeminent. He's supposed to be number one, numero uno. It's not supposed to be. It's not supposed to be whatever you're searching for, whatever I'm seeking out. No, Jesus is supposed to be numero uno in our life. And when we don't allow him to have that place of preeminence in our life, everything is skewed and it's like a house of cards that comes tumbling down. <laughs> this is a word I believe that every Christian should be, should always ask, is Jesus preeminent in my life? That's right. It also talked about the sword. His word is a sword of power that will both conquer nations and also penetrate the heart. I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to kind of speed through this. We don't necessarily need to turn and read it. But in Revelation 19, 11 through 15, it talks about the conquering of nations. It talks about Jesus on a white horse. It talks about the fact that there's a sword that comes out of his mouth. The sword of the spirit, which is the word of God that comes out of his mouth. He realized that there's not going to be any real. I, I mean, now I'm not saying that there won't be any physical fighting. But when Jesus shows up, he's going to speak a word. The book of Hebrews talks about the fact that he upholds all things by the power of his word. I talk, I've talked about it before to y'all because I don't really understand physics. I'm not that smart, but I've been told that atoms are in motion. That, that blows me away, dude. That everything that we look at, everything that we touch, everything that we feel is atoms in motion. If God quits speaking, it all falls apart. I believe that with all my heart. I don't care what the scientist says. If God quits speaking, it all falls apart. And I'm here to tell you right now that there's coming a day when he's coming back and he's going to conquer nations with his word. One word from that powerful mouth, from that powerful sword is going to conquer and destroy nations. Praise God. But not only will it, does that sword of the spirit conquer nations, it also penetrates inside of our hearts. Yes, it does. Yes, it does. Hallelujah. The word of God, Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12. The word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow. And it's a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. How many times have you been in the word of God? I'm telling you, even as a preacher, I'm going to be transparent enough to tell you that there's been times that I've read things in the Bible and like... <laughs> 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 
But I ask the Lord because you know what? Maybe I'm going through things and I read it and I don't want to hear it because my flesh doesn't want to see it. You see what I'm saying? But the Lord kept keeps telling me, he keeps saying, let me tell you something, son. This is my word. Don't monkey around with my word. Don't put your grubby fingers in my word. Preach my word for the way it's written and I will use you. Speak forth my truth. I wrote it down. Say it to the people. Yes. Come on now. Say it to the people. God chose to use marred clay as a vessel that he would put Amen. himself on the inside of to speak forth his truth. I don't he used the, the foolishness of preaching to confound yes. the wise. He uses the foolishness of preaching because the intellect won't believe it to begin with. Mm -hmm. But I'm here to tell you the word of God it will penetrate deep inside your heart. Yes. And long before, listen, it will show you it will discern your heart. It will show you in advance the things that you've been thinking and where it was wrong and, 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 the, and, the, and the steps that you took and the places that you went. It's going to show you where you're all wrong. But will you listen? Will I listen? It's a discerner of the heart. How do you separate? It's hard enough to separate bone from marrow. Have you ever seen? No, you probably never seen a bone marrow aspirator. What are you talking about? That's a mess. They take that cord screw and they stick it on top of that hip bone. You can't numb pain good enough for that, man. That's how you separate bone from marrow. How do you separate spirit from soul? See, the spirit and the soul are the inner makings of the human being, and we're encased in this flesh. But the spirit and the soul are both part of that inner man. The two of them are dynamically connected together, and and they're so closely connected that the only thing that can that we're told can, that can separate it is the word of God. Hallelujah. We the spirit. You know, you are a spirit. Do you know that God is spirit? Those that worship Him must worship Him in spirit and in truth. Angels are spirits. Demon spirits are spirits. Human beings are spirits encased in flesh. Amen. Your soul is who you are. A frog doesn't have a soul. A dog doesn't have a soul. It might be a living, breathing being, but it doesn't. It, it doesn't have a it, it, human beings. Their soul is what makes them an individual. It, it has to do with their. It, it, it has to do with their. In, in intellect and understanding it, it makes up the mind, the will and the motion the word for soul in the Greek language is suke it's where we get the word psyche it's, it's the makeup of the individual person, I'm not saying that there won't be dogs in heaven I don't know, I'm just the preacher, I don't know what's up there I'm sure that if you love horses and dogs, there'll be horses and dogs what I'm trying to say is is that the soul is who you are as an individual Right, right. It's what makes you you. It's what makes me me. Right. The world would lie and say, remember that old song? I'm really telling my age now. Of oh, the spirit in the sky. That's karma. That's Buddhism. That says, so B Buddhism ain't cool, man. No, it's not. It's all the rage now. Buddhism and all this other stuff. No, it's not cool. Because it says that you keep being reincarnated until you go into the next life. And, and that ultimately, when you finally get it right, through, through karma, you get to come back and, and you finally reach the spirit in the sky. We all become part of the spirit in the sky. That's an antichrist spirit. Come on now. That's, a, that's a false unity and a false peace that the spirit of antichrist is trying to bring upon the earth. Lord, help us. The word of God will separate between your soul and your spirit. It will show you what, what's of the spirit of the Lord and, and, and what's of you. Because see, you filter this world through your soul. I mean, you touch it with your physical body, but you filter it. Your thoughts, your mind. You know, each and every one of you as individuals have been made up and made the way that you are because of many times the experiences that you've, that That's you've, right. that you've experienced. That's right. So to some extent, your soul is, is connected to this world to some extent. It, it, part of who you are, part of who you've become has to do with Things from your past that have created you right. have helped to mold you, if you will. Right. That's why when we spend enough time in the Word of God to become reenculturated, you know how you use that word all the time? We've been enculturated by the world. I hope y'all don't get tired of me saying that. We get enculturated by the world and the information and communication that we receive from the world, from their music, from their, from their videos, from their television, from the people that we talk to. Oh man, this dude's so cool. Look at him. Listen to the stuff that he says. I want to take, uh, I believe some of what he's saying. No, no, no. 
If it's not lining up with the word of the Lord, it's not. But we, we allow ourselves to be enculturated. We hung out with certain people. Our parents did certain things, whatever the case. And it, and it affected us. Yeah. Yeah. But we can be reenculturated by the word of God. Amen. Amen. And the word of God will begin to separate and help us to discern the difference between the soul and, and the spirit. Amen. Amen. And sometimes your soul gets in the way. Mm -hmm. Your soul feels emotion. And sometimes we operate off of emotion. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I could sit there. I could, I could stay here for a long time. But I'm going to close. 